Nine times out of ten, it's a woman who calls bartends for Zan in the Westchester Penny Saver. And sometimes when we pull up to a yard in this pickup, she's outside waiting for us. Sometimes she even has something inside for us to eat, which, besides needing money, is why James and I never ask Bark if he wants our help. We just get in his truck and hope he lets us go. Now, on a Saturday morning, he drives us past Poughkeepsie, though. Nobody waiting outside. Maybe this has to do with the $500 this woman offered. She don't feel the need to be friendly beyond that. Or maybe she's with the junk that needs to be hauled. But anyway, Bart pulls off the country road into her driveway, which drops through an uncut lawn to her shabby yellow house. And we all get out. Bark headed to knock on the front door. Hey, I hear it from the left-hand side of the house. I turn, but I don't see nobody. Down here, the voice calls, and there, Crouched near an open crawl space hole is a woman about as dark as me, maybe five years older. Over here, Bark, I shout. Bark makes his way down the porch, then over to her. James and I lagging behind to let her know he's a boss. I took care of the rest of myself, she says. Bark kneels beside her, then pokes his head and a good half of him into the crawl space. Stays in there for a while, making sure I figure that we can do what we need to do him. Then he's back out, and he stands slapping dirt off his knees. Just that oil drum, he says. Yeah, she says. I thought she said there was a bunch of stuff, he says. No, she says, just that. Mm. What's in it, he asks. I have no idea, she says. But she's scratching her arm, and she keeps scratching it. If she's not flat out lying, she's more than a little bit nervous. <laughs> because the thing is, Bart says, I can't just take a drum like that to a dump without them asking what's inside. Then don't take it to a dump, she says. <laughs> just, you know, get rid of it. Bart grabs his unshaven jaw, considering. I'm probably he's stumped by my sisters living this far upstate. Plus, it don't make much sense that any woman living in a house this shabby can have 500, let alone give it to us to haul off a drum with nothing bad in it. It crosses my mind this woman loves some guy who's giving her 500 to get rid of the drum, some dude, maybe a white one, that she loves and cheated with, and that inside the drum is this man's wife. But, <laughs> All kinds of things are crossing my mind, including how I could use 500 divided by three. How about a thousand, she says. Now here's where all of us, including her, gaze off the uncut lawn, the dandelions and the weeds, and then some of them pretty enough tall flowers. We all gaze our separate ways for a long time. Letting whatever truths of what's going on sink into us while we play as if it isn't. And I feel my guts work their way higher towards my lungs, threatening to stay there if Bark agrees. Oh, there's a lot I can do with my share of a thousand. Especially since I'm used to walking away from these jobs with pity and bumps. I could eat more than apples and white bread and ham. I could start saving for a truck of my own to haul things for pay myself. And then to the woman. Bark asks, in cash, as soon as that drum's in your truck, she says. Bark glances at James, who nods. Drake, Bark asks me. And I know he's working me over with his eyes, using them to try not to convince me in there. I don't care either way, man. But what I'm watching is the woman's feet, which are the tiniest bit pigeon toe. And they're also perfectly still, which could mean she's no longer nervous. But my eyes, I know, are avoiding her fingers and her arms. Still, the sight of those pigeon-toed feet coaxed me to trust her. Yeah, I can stay loyal to a woman who stands like that. <laughs> Why not, I answer. I haven't, I tell myself, actually said yes. But when I look up, James is following Bart into the crawl space, and the woman checking me out. Sure appreciate it, she says. In the flat way, someone who can do two men on the same day yet allow none of it to show on her face. But now she's scratching her collarbone. Over and over, she's just scratching it without one bug bite. Yeah, there's death in that drum, I think. But with her pigeon-toed feet aimed at me, I fall even more in love. And then she walks off towards the stream behind her house. 
And it hits me that if I want my share of the thousand, I should get my ass in that crawl space. The actual removal of the drum might take for five minutes, and the last thing I need is Bark and James saying I don't deserve a cent. And then I realize, you know, if I don't take a cent, I might not actually be guilty of anything going on here, but thoughts like that only help if you can afford a lawyer who cares more than a public defender. Plus, I do need to be in Bart's truck to get home. And even before I'm done thinking all this, I'm on my hands and knees, my head brushing morning glory vines, and on its way through the square open in the woman's crack foundation. It's quieter in there. It stinks. James and Barker on their bellies, snaking the way over damp dirt and rocks towards the drum, which lies on its side in the far corner. And with a thousand in mind, I work myself toward them, I'm trying to get a hand on the drum when they do. But Barker yells, yo, we got it, Trey. What you saying, I ask. I'm saying this is a two-man job, so back off. Are you trying to cut me out my share? No. No, it's just, there ain't enough room for all three of us if we want to get this thing past us. So what you want me to do? Bark humps up his backside, he reaches into his front pocket, he pulls out his keys, and tosses them towards me. Just pull the truck down the driveway, he says. His hands dig dirt away from the drum. As close to the house as you can, he says. Bark, I say, you know I can't drive. Sure you can, he says. Just start it, just put it in gear, and steer it so you don't hit me. Okay, I say. Oh, Bark's confidence in me is taking away the little bit I have in myself. I used to have confidence, like gold confidence, but the older I get, I have less. Still, I back myself out of the crawl space. I pretend the woman isn't watching me as I jog up the driveway and bark some track. I hop inside of it, I start it, I put it in drive, I let it roll down there. Steering is easier than I thought, but when I put on the brake, I about fly through the windshield. The woman is still near the stream. She's got her arms folded now. Checking me out like she recognized me from when we were in grammar school together, which I don't know, it's making me quite. There's that kind of thing between us, it's that, that half knowledge about each other, we just ruin the conversation. I want to make love to her bad. Now, Bark and James are yanking the drum top first through the hole in her foundation. The drum's too wide to roll out. They struggle like hungry playground kids. Whatever's in that thing is dove heavy. Wind blows past my face. The woman's now picking her reeds, yellow flower from between the pebbles beside the stream. It's her husband that's in the drama. She got carried away in an argument over nothing, and the thousand is all they ever say. A tray, Bart calls me. You gonna help us or not? I nod. I toss him his keys, but she catches like it's the old days. I walk towards him and James, and all three of us roll the drum to the driveway, flattening a strip of knee-high grass, acting like we haul mystery drums every damn day. When it's time to get it onto the bed, we all take extra care to hold the top of it closed. We heave it up, lower it. Dead weight, I think. If this isn't a course, she would have said so. Mark slams closed the tailgate, he works his toolbox and his scrap to make sure the drum won't move. No way are we taking it to the dumps we sometimes hit. Even the unguarded one that isn't it, supposed to be a dump, the woman has her back to us, she's facing the stream. I'll never see her again, but I need to. Finally, she walks towards the crawl space hole. She puts its screen window back into it, she heads into the house. While she's inside, Jane flicks a horse fly off her neck. She returns and she walks towards us with her lips pursed. Mm. She's even finer looking, sunshine on her face. She gives Bark a handful of cash, folded in half, and counts it. Mostly 20s and nods, slips it into her shirt pocket and says, Anything else? No, she says. Any ideas about where we should take it, she said. That's your business, she says. Anyone asks me, I've never seen that drum in my life. All right, Bark says. And I can tell by how he gets inside his truck without shaking her hand, which he usually does with people we take junk from. He wishes we could just roll the drum back down the lawn and give her back the cash, but he starts the engine. Let's it eat gas while me and James get in beside him, me in the middle. After we back up and ease out onto the road, I notice the woman's gone inside her house, I guess. And we're headed away from the city, I realize, after Bark stops accelerating. North, it seems. Further upstate. 
driving two miles an hour under the speed limit. None of us make it sound. Radio's off. I think to ask Bart where we going, but it's like the three of us have made a side deal not to talk. And if anyone's gonna break that deal, I'm guessing it's gonna be James. But James doesn't say Jack. Neither do Bark and I the whole time we cruise over tar-striped highways zigzagging us towards tree-covered hills. Now I imagine it'll take hours to reach those trees. Maybe it does. But when we're finally alongside the shadows, I don't want to stop. Behind us in the bed, as far as I know, it's only one shovel. Be damned if I'm the one who's gonna use it. We pass a farmhouse. A line of crammed together mailboxes. A boarded up gas station where a rusted sign reminds us when unleaded was a dollar seventy five. Bark scan in the bushy fields on either side of us. It's trying, I can tell by its grimace, to be more smart than scared. We pass the state park, nobody in the guard station. Then Bart speeding down the straight away. There's nobody around us from what I can tell, but no place for the drum. Then Bart breaks and pulls over. Now there's a hill to our right, but it's a football field away. How about here, he asks. Where, James says. Yeah, I say where. Right next to the road. Are you high, I say. You got any better ideas, Bart says? Yeah, someplace more hidden, I say. I mean, trees are you high, he says. The last thing we need is someone up here seeing three brothers walking out of some woods. They gonna follow the truck, then read my license plate, we get out now. Without any cars passing us, we roll it out, we take off quick, there's no way anyone can trace anything to us. Right, let's do it, James says. Fast, he says. And he's out his door, the bark is out his, and again, I tell myself I'm with them anyway, so I might as well make sure I get paid. James can't lower the tailgate, so Bart slaps his hand away, lowers it himself, and they roll out the drum, and I, I do what I can to help, although all I manage is to get my hands on the thing two seconds before they drop it on the weedy emergency lane. And I try to roll it into red bushes 20 feet from the gravel, but Bart's already running back inside the truck, and then James too, and the drum, it feels heavier than it was, and a rock is in the way, and behind me on the highway, a car is coming. And I think to run, then I do, I undo my fly as if I'm about to piss, using this as an excuse to turn my face as the car passes, it's honking its horn. Doesn't stop. It's too dressed up white, but we'll speak to wear it. When I get back in the truck, Bart says, what'd you do that for? To take their eyes off the drums. That was stupid, James says. Well, I don't think so, I say. You might be right, Bart says. Bark waits until the car, shrieking ahead of us down that straightaway is out of sight. And he glances behind us, hits that U-turn, and he takes off in the direction we came from. And now, with the drum gone, James starts talking as if he has to make up for everything we all three didn't say since we left the woman's house, asking why we did it, asking why he did it, saying we should have thought it over, should have discussed it in the privacy we had to ourselves in the crawl space. One of us, he said, should have put a foot down to keep all of us from losing our heads. We could have said no, he shouts. We could have said no at any time. We were greedy. We did it for bad money. Money that big is always evil. Then he goes on about how he hates being poor. Hates the, hates the forever. It's like we were all born into these rubber bags and can't punch our way out. Not even in summer, there never was. He never should have hung around, was even in high school. He should have listened to his mother when, after we won say, she said we were bad influences. God rest her soul. So that's as close as he gets to talking about the death in the drum. And his carefulness about that promises me there was death in their hands down. Even though I've been waiting for him to zip it so I could say that. For all we know, we just dumped off a crammed bunch of laundry that got moldy after the stream rose and flooded the woman's house. There's a million other things besides a person that could be in a drum. Was what I convinced myself while James went off like that. But now that he's done, that million feels like a million too many. 
then a word of my own won't leave my mind. Fingerprints. Bart turns on the radio, presses scan, but it keeps coming back to the station that plays light songs for white folks. He lets it play, though. The news comes on, and I listen, expecting the dude to report a dead body found in a drum, even though I know that's impossible so soon. After the news in, Bart snaps off the radio, and I imagine he's thinking the same thing I For the rest of our lives, we won't, but we'll want to hear any news on any radio or watch it on TV. And I don't need to ask him if this thought's on his mind right now, because a glance from him as we roll towards the city, it tells him. That's how it was in both our championship seasons. All he and I needed was eye contact. So all I needed to know if I should lob the ball down to him, or fake away, come back with a bounce pass, pull up with the jumper, he was getting set to rebound. We'd never say a word, never even nod. We were tight like that. And I was still tight, but I don't like where our tightness is taking us. And James never had that unspoken vibe with us. In fact, he was always yakking at us, and everybody on the court, refs included, even the families in the stands, I used to think this was because he had the least talent of our starting five. But anyway, since then, he's used talk as a weapon in just about every situation he finds himself in, keeping the threat of it to himself at times, and letting the world have it when he's backed into a corner. And in a way, it was good he talked so much when we played ball and hit that eye contact bark and I used, but now he just sits. What makes me worry even more is that it's Bark who finally speaks up. The worst is what he says. I say we go to Mississippi. Mississippi, I say. We dish a truck in Virginia or something, take a bus the rest of the way, we start all over now. Hang on, man. I say, for one thing, where will we stay? We're gonna rent, like we do now. With a thousand dollars. It's not like anything's keeping us in New York, he says. None of us has a woman. None of us has a job other than to haul junk. And maybe this never crossed your mind, Trey, but you can haul junk for cash just about anywhere. But we're gonna go through the thousand like that, James says, with a snap of his fingers. We got gas to buy, bus tickets, food, and you don't just walk into a new town and start living in an apartment and all without a good pile of cash. Bart says. Maybe ten miles pass while the three of us we sit like strangers on an F train. And then just by Bart's suddenly stiff posture, I know what he's got in mind. He's not just headed into the city. He's headed to Belmont Park to try to bet our thousand in the morning. Hey, yo, Bart, tell me we're not going to Belmont, I say. Why not, he says. And I expect James to start lecturing, but he doesn't. Well, I'm not going, I say. Where you gonna go, Bart says? You going back to that stinking apartment away from the cops? Oh, they ain't gonna find me. Well, they ain't gonna find me either, Bart says, because I'll be in Mississippi with a hell of a lot more cash than I have now. So you saying I don't get my share if I don't go to the track, I ask? No, nah, Bart says, you get yours. When it hits me, he's already planning to take a chunk from my third for gas and for wear and tear on his truck, which he does now and then, and which is fair even though it seems unfair because he does it only when he wants cash to bet on horses. So now I'm looking at 300, maybe even only 275. And as many groceries as 275 might buy me, it feels like it's already nothing, no matter whose pocket it winds up in or where. Plus, if Mark does leave from Mississippi, James and I will need to make up for his share of the rent in the apartment. I'll be damned if I'm gonna live with some stranger. And what if he wins? I and Bart usually doesn't win, but almost always he comes close. Now his problem isn't that he doesn't know horses. Fact is, in just about every race I've seen when I've gone to the track with him, he pretty much knows which horse will finish first. His problem is, is he lives for the big man. So we best try factors, which means he has to pick first, second, and third in that exact order, and it's usually third place, or sometimes only the exact that gets it. I'll take you home, Trey. But on the way there, just hear out my plan. Turns on the radio, turns it off. Now we don't bet every race, he said. We bet one. And before we do, we study all the races to see which one's the best. For the thousand, I say. Right. 
put it all on one race, James says, Bark Knox. And you guys are the ones saying we need more cash to move. You got any ideas about how we could make a pile in a hurry? I mean, legally? Now here's where I most wish James would go off on another yak about all sorts of money-making ideas that never entered my mind. But again, he keeps still. And all I can think about when it comes to big, fast money is what would have happened if I had to mess up my knee in the semifinals the first year we won state. Yeah, we won state anyway. Yeah, everybody on the team propped me up over their heads as we left the court, and yeah, the ligament healed in time for us to win state again our senior year. But everyone who scouted us down here saw my ugly ass knee brace, saw how I lost half a second off my first step to the hoop. Even though I compensated my senior year by improving my jumper and my passing game, everyone knew my burst to speed was why I got 34 letters and interest from pro and college scouts my junior year, and that. For all the points and assists I'd rack up, my best words and speed were behind me. So we sit like that, all three of us I imagine, remembering those days. As Bar takes us further down towards the city, and he pulls left onto the spring brick, and exits onto the cross county parkway. The green of the trees and the bushes and the fields around us are too soon replaced by faster traffic and concrete, reminding us we live in the Bronx. It's not Mississippi. The death in the drum, or the hope of winning a pile of cash that changes my mind about whether I'll go along with Bart's plan. It's this appearance of the Bronx that does it. It's that feeling of being squeezed in. It's that feeling of knowing that you are one of thousands, if not millions of brothers caged into a future where you will finally do something no whole barred stupid. There's that stretch of moments. After we pay the toll for the throgs and that bridge and just stay under the speed limit while we rise, when you see the blue water, you see the yachts on either side and you think the good life can happen to at least a few people who live where you do. But then the water's behind us and the Mercedes cuts us off as we sit with the big collection that never the construction and the slowdowns and you sit, it's itching to move forward knowing that Belmont is, after all, a park with burgers and picnic tables and tents that sell beer. Fuck it, today. we're almost there. And then we are there. To so Belmont's grounds, me, Ambar, and James, both of them, in hazier sunshine that we came from, we look older than I thought that we were. And Bark buys a program, a thousand again did it as it was to pay for our parking and our entry fees. And he sits on a painted green bench near where they bring the horses to sat and pet them before they bust their ass out on the track. They already ran the first two races, he says. He's a little pissed. And he slouches. He studies away while James and I sit on either side of him like we're shielding his head from the thoughts of the white chumps walking past. Whose clothes say they know far less about horses than they should. All we need, I think, is for Bart to find that one, that best race, and to concentrate enough to pick the three horses in the right order. Now the death in the drum, that means pressure, I know, but Bark, I remember, he played his best under pressure. In fact, lack of pressure was why he never made the pros or a college team either. In high school games, he knew we win, which was most of them. He could never get himself to try all that hard. And if he believed our coach, word got out that he was lazy. Those few big games, the major pressure ones, always showed until he sweat on the court. And even if his shot was off or he dragged down fast break for being out of shape, he did the kinds of things that makes championships. Like elbowing the wind out of the other team's star with the rest of Or giving me a soft high five just before I told the line for a free throw. Now he's walking us to another green pitch. It's besides the home stretch of the track. Again, James and I would sit up against the show. Flipping pages in his program, back and forth, race four, race six. He's got it down to those two he's told me without even clearing his throat. Now, I won't race four, so we'll know sooner if we won or not, but I don't want to mess with what all those numbers are teaching him. He holds race six close to his face. He sighs. Look off around us. We're going to do it in the fourth, he says. You know which horses James asked? The three horse for show, and the one 
It's just a matter of where we go with the four to seven to the nine after that. Mm, that don't exactly sound solid, James says. I'm just being straight with you, Bart says. What's left of the race today are hardest shit to pick. Could we just go with the three to one to finish first and second, I ask? Now that being exact, Bart says. Everyone's gonna box the three one exact, which means it's hardly gonna pay. But we can't take the three and the one with all those other horses you like, I mean, I mean, in, in trifectas. Well, that would be three different bets, Bart says. Meaning we bet on the 300 some on each, which again means a low pay. But we'd be more likely to win. Bart returns to studying, but I guess he's also considering what I said then. Then I'm sure he's also trying to figure out how much each of those three trifectas could pay, but then I'm not sure anything anymore. So how much do we need, he asked. Who knows, James says, but you had to think five or six grand be cool. Now here's where I both believe we'll win, but I also wish we would. I wish we could just get in the truck and go home. I want to start the day over. I want to go back in time even before that, and I want to meet the pigeon toed woman before whatever happened in her life that forced her to call Bart. And I want to make love to her back then, night after night. So often and well, the drum don't stay empty. But it's not back then. It's today. And now race three is running without Bart betting a penny on it, which reminds me, we're here for serious business despite the white college boys besides us drinking beer, all of them hooting as the six horse pulls ahead. Bart looks up as the six wins easy. Glances at the odds board and says 25 to 1. He hunches over and reread the program. Hey, you know what, James says? Shut up, man. What the man think? You right, James says. Seagulls almost land on the lawn inside the track that they swoop up. They're headed north toward the drum. That six horse was headed north towards the drum. The wind blows past the three horses headed north towards the drum. The more I look at this box, the more I can see any horse finishing up with the one and the three. And the way the crooks here fix these races, any horse could beat the one and the three. So what do we do, I ask? So we keep the one and the three with every other horse in the race. Which means what, James asks? Which means if the one and the three finish first, second, and third, we collect. Oh, that sounds good, James says, but they both have to finish in the top three. And that sounds tough, I say. It's as easy as I can make it, Mark says. Well, how much will we win, I ask? Our trucks, anywhere from double our money to a ton. But like you say, what good is double our money? Trade boxes. We gotta leave here with something. Which tells me that today, he's lost faith in horses. Now if it were yesterday, or any day before we moved that drum, he'd have enough faith for the three of us, but it's today. It don't matter he got more cash in his pocket than he's ever had at the track. Today is today. It's today, and we all three see it. The horses walk onto the track, a jockey on each. And then Bart stands and says, let's do it. James and I follow him under the grandstand to the betting windows where we wait in a short but slow line. And finally, Bart leans in close to our telly, the old white lady. And he talks so quietly that she needs to lean in too. Then he pulls out the cash. He hands it over for a ticket. He reads even after his feet begin to shuffle off. Gentlemen, Taylor shots. Your change? She's holding three twenties. James jogs back to her and he takes them. He gives one apiece, me and Barb, and he stuffs the third in his pocket. And as we walk back out towards the home stretch, it hits me. I might have done something for a 20. I'd never do again for all the money in the world. Bart veers left towards the bench near the home stretch. Shouldn't we watch by the finish line, James asks. But Bart keeps on. James stands still, his knees locked, yakking about how what we see from the bench won't matter, about how he wants to eyewitness the very end, about how if all of us shout enough near the finish line, we could affect whether we win or lose. Go ahead and shout, Bart says. I'm gonna watch from here. James huffs off, leaving me to decide who to watch with. I don't follow him since the last thing I need is the sound of his voice. And I don't
don't sit beside Bart because I'm pissed. He's the reason I went upstate. Stand where I am, partway between Bark and the finish line. In front of the odds board beyond the dirt where they'll run. And it all of a sudden don't mean nothing that the three of us won state twice together. Lived together ever since, might end up together in Mississippi for the rest of our lives. We're all strung out along that wire fence like cousins and never been. Each of us is alone as the old drunk besides me. All of us is stuck inside ourselves as whoever's rotting in that drone. We stay like that until the horses are in the game. I glance over at Bart and nods. Then I see that the horses are running. They're already on their way down the back stretch. And because of their distance, I can't tell if we're winning. And then because of the odds board, I can't see them at all. And I hear names being called, but to us it's all about the one and the three. And then I see every horse out there bunched into a pack. And as they breach the far turn, what looks like a three is in second. They're in their best full sprints toward and past Bart. And they're passing me. And they get whipped with the three for show and frame. But the rest of them are gaining, or maybe they're not. The three might be fading. And a woman in the grand station screams. And then I watch the rear ends of ten horses, and I haven't seen the one at all. James is still beside the finish line. He's pointing, but he's not yelling. And Bark, with his arms at his sides, he leans back against his bench. And then both of them are walking towards me. And if I'm in charge, well, Bark asks James. Man, I couldn't tell, James says. They were all bunched together. Bark shrugs. His eyes aimed at the odds board on the three boxes besides win, place, and show. A little tin is in the win box. The other two boxes are unlit. See, we, we was right to key them with every other horse, Buck says. Nobody would have guessed the tin. Which means a big payoff if I ask, Park Knox. Yeah, yeah, if we win. Then, in the place box, I see the lit up number one. All right, here we go, James says. And the whole board goes dark, blinks twice, then lights up. But the tin is still up over the one. The show box is still empty. Hey, 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 the three was towards the front, I say, wasn't it? Well, it was when they passed me, Park says, and it was supposed to stay up there. Now, he won't look at James, so I do. Well, James, I say, did the three hold on? It might have, he said, but I'm telling you, bro, from where I was standing, I really couldn't see. Oh, son of a bitch, Mark says. Clearest drawn number is now in the show box. <laughs> hey, it's not official, Bark says. And when it is, we gotta pretend like it isn't, because the last thing we need is somebody following us out to the parking lot. All right, all right, let's get in line, I say. Let's get our cash, let's get up out of here. And just chill, Bark says. And then he's heading back into the grandstand, and James and I, we follow. James says the three held on, man. And he grabs my wrist. I'm like, yeah, that's it. And we did it. We did it. <laughs>